about um, Professor Grayson and, I'm sorry, the name is not just gone off. Well, I don't know who your name is. Caitlin, sorry, from the University of the Witwatersrand. So I was in charge of the uh, allocating the, the chairs and everything of the program. And why do you think I chose Witz? Well, it is my alma mater. <laughs> so, that one, please. Well, it was because we were such nice people. Oh, that too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I launch into bits, I just want to take a minute for a personal message. So I've been involved in promoting student success in various ways, pretty much all my career. But since 2012, I've had the opportunity to be involved at national level in various ways. And thanks to the Kresge Foundation, I attended my first dream conference in 2012. And I was really pretty amazed by what can be done um, if you're really intentional and if you mobilize a large network of people behind common goals. And the last session, particularly if any of you were at that 2012 conference, I was actually moved to tears because there was a group of Hawaiian staff and students who gave us a performance and uh, showed us what they were doing to promote student success and also strengthen their culture. Um, and then since then I was involved in many of the things that led up to the Sia Pumalela project and the Sia Pumalela project now. Um, this is the last time I'm going to be presenting at a Sia Pumalela conference because I'm about to retire. So I just want to say thank you very much to the Kresge Foundation for your fantastic support and to Sadie and to the wonderful colleagues and friends who have been part of this journey and who will continue after I've moved on to much greener pastures because there are going to be a lot more cows where I'm going to. <laughs> okay, so just to recap where we're coming from, um, many of you would have seen this model that we developed at BITS and we had approved in 2019. It's a holistic model for student-centered uh, support and we identified four areas of student support, academic, health and wellness, material needs, and personal development, and then a range of specific support initiatives related to each of these four areas. Many of you also will have seen this diagram, which shows where we were in 2018 before we developed the Institutional Framework for Student Success. So we had lots of support initiatives scattered all over the place, like islands, some big, some small, with the students having to swim from one to another. And so, since we've put our holistic student success support uh, framework in place, we have built a lot of bridges. We've consolidated some of our initiatives and we've built a lot of bridges. We have not centralized, though. And I'm going to talk about what we have done instead and the way of working that we've developed. So the rest of this presentation is about our way of working so one of the things to say is we haven't actually changed a lot of our structures. So we have these various people who are the, the kind of top line managers. And then we have um, lots of people working and providing various forms of support who report to these line managers, and that hasn't changed, but who are working with each other um, much, much more than was the case in 2018. So what we've done is we've developed a network of people model for working uh, with systems thinking at its core. So in terms of a system, a system consists of elements and in, in this approach the people are the elements, uh, the people are interconnected and the interconnections are both information flows and relationships. So although we have not centralized the activities, we have really good interconnections now so that many of the people who are involved in, uh, in or responsible for running the various initiatives know each other, like each other, have relationships, um, frequently pick up the phone, dial in on a Teams meeting, and sometimes now post-COVID even actually pop into each other's offices. 
And importantly for a system, for, for something to be a system, it has to have a purpose, a coherent purpose. So now we have a really clear, coherent purpose. So <clears throat> the way the network of people works is we have a whole lot of different committees and working groups as well, and task teams, I'll tell you about those just now. Um, and each person on the committee or the working group represents a particular constituency. And I want to stress the word represents. Because it's easy to have committees of what may be called representatives but aren't really. So in our system, or in our network of people model, representatives are people who have the respect and the trust of their constituency. They represent the views and the issues and the concerns of their constituency on whatever committee they're serving on. And then they also communicate back what was discussed at the committee or the working group. So I want to, to stress that the representatives have a critical role to play in the two-way communication between whatever that central committee or working group is and their constituencies. But the network itself also facilitates information flow, so you don't necessarily have to work through your representative, um, because as I said, we've, we've got to know each other. And, you know, so maybe a student advisor from um, the science faculty has a student who needs food support, and then they can just call directly to the unit that is responsible for pro uh, providing support with food. So I want to give you a couple of examples of uh, how this model has developed and been implemented over time. So the model we first started to develop in 2019 when we were putting together our institutional framework for student success and then we go to 2020 and emergency remote teaching and learning and COVID. So it's like, okay, this is a really good opportunity to trial our network of people model. So that's what we did. We established different networks to do very specific things really fast. Really, really fast. We had a month between when we had to stop face-to-face -face teaching and send students home in March 2020 and when we started doing emergency remote teaching in an online mode in April. So we had a network of people that were involved in activating all our courses on the learning management system because although they were all there, in theory, they weren't all activated um, and also to monitor the usage of it. We had another network of people that enabled students and staff to access the learning management system, but also be able to just even access the internet. Uh, we had a group that were working on supporting students with online learning and also with their psychosocial needs. We had a group that were supporting staff with online teaching and assessment, and then we had all kinds of interconnections and some of us sitting in the middle getting information from the various networks and helping it flow to the other networks so that we could take a coordinated but really fast approach to enabling our teaching to continue in an online mode. Then in 2021, we had another, uh, I won't say bigger, but another really challenging opportunity to develop our networked approach further. So during 2020, although we completed the academic year, the learning management system that we were using struggled, crashed, um, was not really designed for the, the intense usage that we were putting into. And so we knew we were going to have to get a new learning management system. We signed the contract for that one on December 24th, 2020. Our new academic year, which would have started in February 2021, was um, pushed back to March 8th, 2021, because of the delay in the school results. Thank heavens. So we had a whole two months <laughs> to transition the entire university of 40,000 students to a new learning management system. Um, the, the company that we use now didn't think it could be done, but we did, uh, with a lot of support from them. And so we took our network of people approach 
and we added to it an agile project management approach. So at the center we had a project implementation committee and the project implementation committee had representatives in the sense that I referred to earlier. People that really were representing particular constituencies and a wide range of constituencies. Um, academic and support and student support across the institution. Uh, we set up task teams. Now, one of the things about, for those of you who maybe haven't used an agile approach before, one of the nice things about it is you can set up cross-functional task teams quickly, achieve a particular task, and then disband. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, so we had, a, so Canvas is the LMS we use, so we had a task team working with them every week. We had a student support task team, uh, we had a communications task team putting out weekly bulletins for seven weeks to the entire university community. Uh, and then we drew on existing communities of practice and pulled them as well into the model. So we had a community of practice for the instructional designers, we had a community of practice for the student advisors, and then um, Two of us who were doing the kind of high-level project management of this, one was the senior manager for ICT and, and then me, and so we were reporting into our seniors pretty much daily who were then um, informing the rest of the senior executive team. And then a third example, uh, this was last year we implemented Gateway to Success. So last year was the first time that we had students really back on campus. and. Our senior DBC academic said, I'm really worried, you know, these students won't have been on campus or um, not much at school either for that matter for two years. They would have lost a lot of learning opportunities and we need to do something to help them. So the Dean of Student Affairs and I put our heads together and we said, okay, uh, we will run a holistic, integrated, student life and academic transition program. We'll make it compulsory, we'll do it for three weeks initially. This year we reduced it to two, but last, week, last year it was three because we could only have limited numbers of students on campus at one time. We still had some COVID restrictions. Uh, it had some fully online courses. Um, one fabulous interdisciplinary course called Climate Change and Me that all 6,000 of our first year students took. Um, and then also online uh, academic integrity course and digital abilities, and then a whole lot of on-campus activities. As I said, last year in limited groups, this year we could take bigger groups. Um, and, and people across the institution, so again, the network model, we had this project committee, which had people from the faculties, people from student affairs, um, people involved in the courses, people involved in the facilities, people involved in the student, um, in the registrar's office, involved in student enrollment, um, ICT people, all the key role players, and then all the task teams that spun off and did the actual work. And just to mention last year, when we did it for the first time, we had four months to plan this for 6,000 students. So uh, there are three examples of how we have developed this network of people model. So important things to say, one is that you can see that it's a means of bringing people together uh, to achieve something quite quick and, um, and work together for a specific purpose. But that doesn't mean that we don't continue to interact with each other, it just means we can actually bring about quite big changes. One of the other really important things to say is, you know, we, we, we talk about how important it is for students to feel a sense of belonging, and of course it is, but staff also need to feel a sense of belonging. And staff also need to feel connected. Um, so we have connections across the institution that are, have really strengthened relationships, as well as facilitating the flow of information. So one of the things that makes a lot of systems fail is that the information gets blocked, it doesn't come to the right people at the right time, sometimes it's wrong information. So by involving so many people across the institution and quite deep down into the institution, there's a lot more information that flows across the institution which can then get picked up and addressed um, by various people in various ways. 
And it reduces the feeling of isolation. You know, it's, it's really hard, especially during COVID, but I mean, even now, it's really hard when people say, oh no, you know, it, this is so difficult and I have to do it by myself. Well, you don't have to do it by yourself. You really don't. Uh, and I just thought I'd put in this uh, comment from, or this quotation from <coughs> Brene Brown. So she, she talks about the importance of people needing to feel connection and belonging. And she says, connection is the energy that's created between people when they feel seen, heard, valued, when they can give and receive without judgment. And belonging is the innate human desire to be part of something larger than us. So the other thing that's happened through this approach is we have a sense of common purpose and a commitment to student success in ever-widening circles of people in the university. And so now it's even in our BITS 2033 strategic framework, which is being implemented from this year. So, so here's a quote. Our people are at the center of what makes BITS great. We are collegial, open-minded, and respectful. We're accountable and always act with integrity. We foster a welcoming environment and embrace the diversity of our backgrounds. And then a little later on it says, we commit to exposing our students to a cosmopolitan student life and experience that fosters a sense of belonging and the development of lifelong networks and friendships. Offering our students a wide range of student development experiences and challenging intellectual engagements that enables them to become active citizens and leaders in all sectors of a diverse society, promoting an environment of care and holistic wellness and using evidence-based data, science, and research to identify barriers to student success. So you can hear Sia Pumalela coming through in our 2033 strategic framework, which I think is just fantastic, because now it's, it's embedded in, in who we are and what we want to do. So, so just final two slides. We, we have a whole lot of initiatives and projects to support students success, and I've underlined a few of the more recent ones, but what's making it sustainable is that we have created this ever-expanding network of people across the institution. So we have a growing number of people who are believing and uh, committed to the fact that student success is now everyone's business. Thank you. Grayson. My name is Caitlin Lee Thomas and I'm a BSc Chemistry with Chemical Engineering student at Wits University. <laughs> so before I actually commence with my presentation, I would like to start off by saying that I don't think that many of us as students are actually aware of the efforts in the background. Uh, geared towards student development and student success, which I'm fortunate to now witness because I've been exposed to this. So I would like to say thank you, danke, sia bonga, to all of you for your efforts. So when I was first approached to co-present alongside Professor Diane Grayson, I thought, wow, what an honor. And then I got to this ballroom yesterday and I said to myself when I looked around, I don't think I've ever been surrounded by this many esteemed people. <laughs> so I told myself, shoot, now you are rolling with the big guns, aren't you? <laughs> so I've always aspired to go to Wits University. And now I'm humbled by the opportunity that I have to share my experience as a student on behalf of other Wits students. The support that I've received from Wits has been instrumental from the journey to where I, from where I started to where I currently am as I stand before you today. So exciting, overwhelming, daunting, these are a few of the emotions which I experienced when transitioning from my second, secondary to tertiary education environment. From school uniforms, school bells, and complaining about the fact that I had to study from a textbook, which was this big. 
I soon realized, when I came to WITS, that there was no uniform, no bell signaling me to go to the next class, which was now called a lecture, which means I had to be more comfortable for my time management and punctuality. And lastly, let's not even go to how the textbooks increased by a substantial amount. It felt like I had to conquer Mount Everest just to get a pass mark. However, WITS provided me with the resources that I needed to make this transition feel a little less daunting than what it had initially seemed. So these are some of the resources which I was able to utilize amongst many others available at WITS University. So Prof. Grayson also touched on the Gateway to Success program, which was just known to me as an orientation program when I was in my first year. This helped me to navigate my way around campus and to form connections with other students as well as my mentor. Then the careers, the counseling and careers development unit helped me to deal with intense stress during my exam periods. And how can I forget the faculty student advisors? I recall sitting on a Wednesday afternoon in a lecture hall and two academic advisors, Dr. Dimas and Dr. Kamara walked in and myself and my fellow peers, we looked at each other and thought, Asian, can these people not give us a break? It's only day three of the orientation program. Little did I know that the impact that their stories had would, be a, would last for a lifetime. They shared about how their struggles as students did not stop them from attaining their PhDs. And I sat back and thought to myself, this is the hope that I needed. And I was filled with gratitude. And I said, now I have to grab this opportunity and make the fullest out of it. So when the tertiary academic environment threw me lemonade, lemons, I had to make the lemonade. I attained many skills from the resources which were available to me, such as how to better manage my time and stress levels. And the writing skill workshops helped me to construct my lab reports much better. I also had to learn how to modify many of my study skills from a secondary education environment in high school to now the university environment where much had changed. And as they say, too much is given, much would be required or expected. So I was able to now fulfill my greatest passion and help other students uh, using the support I received. I did this through now mentoring first year engineering students, part of the academic and development unit, as well as being a former committee member of Engineers for the Future Society and a class rep in my first year. This allowed me to highlight the value of these, these resources for other first year students so that they could feel that you are not alone. Now as much as WITS has availed much of these resources to us, I find that many students often discover them far too late in the academic journey. And I feel that maybe from a perspective of a student, I think that if these resources were maybe incorporated into the academic plan, for example, if time management now became a course or a module, maybe students would be compelled to take these resources much more seriously. One thing that I came to realize by interacting with students is the importance of holistic development as a student. Student success is not an individual effort. We as students, we need the support of our lecturers, our universities, fellow classmates and our families to succeed. Through the mentorship program, I've seen how the ADU has actually helped first year engineering students as third and fourth year students are now giving off their lunch breaks in order to provide presentations for first year students who maybe have not done something like engineering drawing at school. Many first year students would come to me through the mentorship program, which I could interact with some of them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and say, you know what, after they failed maybe a first class test in semester one, I don't think I'm smart enough. Or they would say, I don't think I'm doing the correct degree. And this is a time where you really need to reassure students and I tell them, if you are there, 
you are there for a reason. Because I don't believe that God makes mistakes. So trust in yourself, trust in God, and trust in the process. When it comes to being smart, I don't believe that being in university is a matter of how smart you are. Because when you come to the university, you leave all your distinctions at the door. I think it is a matter of mindset. Because whatever you conceive and you believe in your mind that you can achieve, that is what determines your success as a student. And in that way, perseverance and accountability becomes inevitable when you realize your purpose in your degree. I would like to conclude by saying that WITS has definitely given me the resources and tools I've needed and supported me in this journey in a way that I could give back to the student community. Through these resources, I've not only learned the necessary academic skills for my degree, but I now feel more confident in stepping out into the working space. As much as I don't have it all figured out, I know that this contributes to me holistically and my development as a person. And now I look forward to the next transition from undergrad to postgrad level. I would like to leave you with a quote by Henry Ford, which I think is much uh, relevant to the Sia Pumelela uh, conference. And it goes like this, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. But working together is a success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting uh, presentation. We can have a couple of questions, if there are. Any questions? Well, maybe I could ask a, a question. Um, how, how does the hierarchy of your institution break uh, down so that you can build these interconnected um, networks because there is a lot of power in any institution. So you, you have to work with institutional culture, right? You can't work against it. <laughs> um, one, one of the things that is part of its institutional culture is we've got really outspoken academics. <laughs> they are not people who you can say, shut up and do what I tell you. <laughs> um, so if you work with that kind of uh, institutional culture, you, you can actually harness it for good. Um, by in, Instead of those people seeing it, being seen as fractious or difficult, they then are embraced into the, into the network <laughs> and, and the people in the hierarchy, so the DVCs and the deans in the hierarchy um, are understanding <laughs> that, that those voices are important and that we're not going to try and stamp them out, we can't, we can't, so we're not going to try, we're rather going to try and listen. And I think that the more that people realize that um, everyone has something to say um, and that the more people get a chance to say, the less the fractious they become, <laughs> I think that's quite important. When, when you get heard, you don't have to shout, right? Um, the, I think that there's a kind of growing realization that, that actually it's worth get, letting people have a voice and not threatening your position. Actually, we don't want your position up there in the hierarchy, <laughs> um, but we do want to be a part. So I think that it's a kind of growing sense of institutional belonging and togetherness. It's not perfect, but we're, we're on the road. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you have a question? No. You have a question, sir. Uh, yes? Is there, obviously, is there a high performance? 
things you can as you heard it. How do you... Um, Just wait while we get it. Mark, please. student take a knock on their sense of identity, performance identity, because as you said, the distinction you leave them by the door when you enter. How do you help them not identify with failure or to help them dust themselves out and to reinvent themselves inside the university? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so in that case, um, as a student, as a mentor, uh, we actually held a, during the lunchtime break, we hold presentations for students. So I actually did a presentation a few weeks back um, dealing with the exact same thing that you've actually asked about. And it was just about looking at your failures, but through a positive lens. So in a sense that the theme was that you are not defined um, in that sense by your current situation, but keep your eyes on your final destination. So it was centered around basically, like I said, going back to mindset. Um, and trying to just encourage students to look at their situations from a positive point of view. And to also ask for help when you need it. Because I think as students, you're scared to ask for help because you're intimidated by lecturers. Um, so yeah, just encouraging students to ask for the help when they need it and to approach us too, because we've been where they have been. Thank you. So that ends this session, and we look forward to the next conversation from our next partner. Thank you very much.